Hi, good evening. I'm Dr. Philip McMillan. Thank you for joining me as we tackle this bit of breaking research about whether or not characteristics of the COVID vaccine, specifically the mRNA, could lead to or predispose to cancer. Where did that come from? This is big stuff. So what I'll be doing is that I'll be going through this paper, a recent review that technically is only going to be fully published on the 1st of May about methyl pseudouridine. That's technically part of the mRNA vaccine, friend or foe of cancer. And so we'll be going through a little bit of the science. I'll try and break it down as simply as I can and what the relevance is in terms of cancer. As usual, before we start, we'll be doing a little bit of housekeeping. And the first bit of housekeeping that I need you to do, and I've got it here so that you understand, is when you see a video, you'll see a subscribe button. That's the first thing that you do. You click on the subscribe button there. The other thing that you need to do is that right below it, you will see the first line here of some writing. You click on more, and it will then take you to all the instructions about the various things that are going on. So that's the first thing that I need you to do. In that, on this video, you're going to see a link to Humming Heroes. This is the book that we had recently produced, and it is now in Amazon, or going to be in Amazon, from the 29th of April, 2024. And you can pre-order it only for a small price because our purpose is to try and get this to number one. And so you can register for it there, click on the link, put in your email address. We will send you the pre-order link. This is essentially what it looks like. It's a great book, science, beautiful pictures. It's not just for children. This is quite remarkable science. So that's the first thing that I need you to do. The second thing is that in the description link as well is my third part of my COVID Advanced 360 as I try and explain the science around COVID-19 from my autoimmune perspective. This is the recording. And so you, there are some free tickets, there are some paid tickets. So if you're interested, go and sign up. Again, that is in the description. So you can then join us on Thursday, this Thursday, the 25th, uh, for this next recording. Additionally, if you are interested in the full course, pre-launch sale is still ongoing. The link is in the description. We've already put in two of the parts, which are composed of at least six modules. And so there's already a significant amount of information um, already on the course. The part three is coming up shortly. So join us in that process. Wonderful. So let's get back to the question. What really is this paper about? Now, whenever I see a paper like this, you know that it is challenging for them to get it published because it goes against the narrative or it's asking big questions, questions that really should have been answered very early on. We can understand the emergency rollout, but you would think that all the regulators would want to know whether or not any of these issues could be a problem. So as I said, the first thing that you have to notice is the date. May 2024, International Journal of Biological Macromolecules. So it's actually, um, it's not yet in paper. So it's coming by the end of the month in another few weeks. What's interesting is the authors. When I looked at the authors here, and you can see this one here, this author here is Mexico. Uh, this author here is the United Kingdom. This author here, is Canada. This author here is the USA. This author here is Saudi Arabia. And what that indicates is usually that the authors recognize that this is controversial. And so they are broadening their reach. So it's not easy for them to be targeted. Meaning that if all of this research came from, say, one institution, it's then very easy to target that institution, pull down that paper because we don't like what it says. In this case, this is a broad global consortium. And it's what you usually find researchers doing when they're anxious about what it is that they're publishing. 
And they knew that this would be a big point. So the first question you need to understand is that bit about what exactly is methyl pseudouridine. And I've got here a good little paper, and this was from 2021, where it was highlighting the modifications in an emergency, the role of N1 methyl pseudouridine in COVID-19 vaccines. It's very interesting that the Nobel Prize was given for pseudouridine, but they didn't actually use it in the context of mRNA. And so that in itself is a fascinating fact. Here is it explaining in a little bit more detail what actually happens. So you have to understand this in order for you to understand where the question came from. So they knew what was the spike sequence of the spike protein, the sequence in terms of the RNAs. So they then built that sequence, synthetic mRNA. They then packaged it in a lipid nanoparticle. They would then inject it so that this would get inside cells. And then the cells, this is it here, the packaged mRNA goes inside the cell. It releases the mRNA. The mRNA then does the processing in the ribosome. It then makes spike protein, which is then put on top of the cell. It then triggers the immune system, the B cells, to then produce antibodies against this spike protein. In the process, it also creates little pieces of the protein to put on the surface. And this then also alerts the immune system after it has done, done this triggering to then destroy this cell. So the cell should die after it has been doing the work of triggering the immune system. Here you have the picture of uridine. So uridine is just one of the four parts of making an RNA molecule. And it's usually a very clear and sophisticated sequence. And they just alter. It's like a little alphabet. But instead of using uridine, they then did an isomer, which is they kind of flipped it around. So you'll notice that there is a slight difference. The, the original uridine doesn't have the N there. And then it has a methyl group probably attached there. And so this is slightly different from uridine, but it still can be recognized by the ribosome to make spike protein. So you'll be wondering, why did they go through all that problem in order to try and see if they can do that? Well, this is what it would look like here. Um, you can see this is the, taken from the same paper from 2021. This is the full sequence of the spike protein. It has a little cap at the end and then uh, an early sequence. But you will notice that attached on the top here is what they represent as the methyl group. And the purpose of that methyl group, and so everywhere that you saw U in this code, is where one of these methyl pseudouridine um, uh, molecules are located. It's not clear exactly if they did it for every single U um, or what percentage they actually did. But the purpose of that was that it would then trick the immune system. And so the immune system would not respond. So this is what, again, it looks like. Again, taken from the paper in 2021. And so in order to understand where the question about the cancer comes from, you have to understand the science of what was done in the first place. So here again is what normally happens in the body. So if there is some RNA produced, let's say a virus producing RNA that is not supposed to be there with high uridine content, what would then happen is when it gets into the cytosol, it has some specific um, receptors here. This is TLR8, TLR7, TLR3 that can recognize some of these um, mRNAs. Additionally, in the cytosol, there is another thing that is called RIG1. They have MDA5, PKR. All of these are there to try and act against viruses and other mechanisms from taking over the cell. So when they recognize this, it then triggers the, um, the nucleus or the cell to produce interferons. 
and these interferons will then suppress the whole mechanism. The problem that they had with mRNA is that if that occurred after the injection, the immune system would destroy the, R MR the mRNA before it actually made any proteins, then it wouldn't work. So this was the purpose of tricking the immune system to be able to evade these mechanisms, this endosomal recognition, the cytosolic recognition, so that you wouldn't have this interferon response, and therefore the cell would produce all the spike proteins and the immune system would be triggered. That's the essence of what they wanted. The question is, it seems that nobody then asked, well, you know, could things go wrong? What happens if it does what it does so effectively that it leads to other problems. That's usually what happens in medicine and science, but around the COVID pandemic, medicine and science seems to have been forgotten. So here is what was asked by the same um, group of people, the same group of researchers. So as I said, this was their review when they decided to look at it in a bit more detail. So they asked that question about exactly what could be the implications of what was going on. Actually, before I show you that, I think that I should let you see exactly what they had said in that review paper. And it's right here. And so in purple, it's highlighted. Evidence is provided that adding 100% of N-methylpseudouridine to the mRNA vaccine in a melanoma model stimulated cancer growth and spread metastasis, while non-modified mRNA vaccines induced the opposite results, thus suggesting that COVID-19 mRNA vaccines could aid cancer development. So they're very careful here because they don't want to say that it does. And so based on this compelling evidence, we suggest that future clinical trials for cancer or infectious diseases should not use mRNA vaccines with 100% um, methyluridine modification, but rather ones with a lower percentage. Now, they have said this, even though they don't know. In effect, they're saying, guys, you need to check this. They have checked it with 100%. Suppose it's 95% or 70% or 50% or even 20%. Will it do the same thing that they noticed with regards to their mouse models? Because they then injected the 100% and found that it triggered the um, spread of, um, of cancer um, in the mouse model. So they know that these mRNA at 100% could trigger that. The first question would be, well, what percentage of the spike of uh, the mRNA with the... Um, the, 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 vac the vaccine is methyl pseudouridine. If it's 95%, is that an issue? If it's 20%, is that an issue? So their next question is, well, if this is occurring, what could be the mechanism? So this is them here putting together what they think is the mechanism. So normally, you would find that the RNA, in this case, double-stranded RNA, would go through the mitochondria. It would then trigger these interferon signals, which would then kill the cell, suppress the production of more um, viral particles. That's the normal process. However, what they, they suspect is that when you use this vaccine 100%, you end up with interferon signaling impairment which then leads to evasion of immune detection, enhanced antigen synthesis, and therefore enhanced immune response. So this is what the, the developers of the vaccine wanted. Conversely, along with that, you end up with immune suppression, reactivation of infection, and unrestrained cancer growth because of the suppression of interferon. This makes perfect sense because we know that there is this strange pattern about Epstein-Barr reactivation. You'll also see issues with regards to shingles reactivation. It suddenly makes sense. If you suppress the interferon, 
that the body normally uses to keep these things in check, then you can have a resurgence of a viral infection. It's important to note that interferon is also critical for cancer. It's part of the immune system response. Remember, fundamentally, cancer largely represents an immune failure. It's not anything else because once the immune system is active, even if someone has significant risks, the immune system can try and identify the cancer cells and destroy them. So any kind of thing that interferes with this is likely to increase the risk in susceptible people. So it's not necessarily across the board, but in people who have multiple layers already lost and their last layer was interferon, if you take that away, you could then see increased risk of cancer with them. That in theory. So here is what they said towards the end. This is in their conclusion part. And it was obvious that the colleagues at BioNTech who were developing the mRNA technology did not anticipate the, pos the possibility that adding, this is N-methyl pseudouridine to mRNA to avoid an excessive inflammatory response could make people susceptible to other pathogens and allow cancer growth by suppressing the immune system. Additionally, they went on to say, and I've highlighted, it demonstrated that adding 100% methyl pseudouridine to mRNA vaccines in a melanoma model stimulated cancer growth and metastasis, meaning spread. If we're seeing more advanced cancer occurring now, where people are presenting for the first time with metastatic disease, for which some people have used the term turbo, but you could use, you know, rapid, um, you know, extremely fast, you know, any other term you want, is that part of the mechanism? That's really what we need to know. As usual, there is an elephant in the room. Nobody really wants to actually know this because it has implications for many companies and governments and regulators. Because how do you explain that three years down the line, it's only independent scientists who are figuring this out and not regulators? Why didn't governments want to know? And why are they not pushing to try and get these answers? Is there actually a risk? Nobody even wants to look at excess deaths. There's still suppression of the fact that maybe cancer numbers are going up, even though everyone seems to have an increased risk at the moment. So there is a problem, and the problem is not going to go away. As usual, never forget the elephant in the room. It's knocking over chairs. It's banging into glass. You're not able to do any teaching in the classroom. It's not going away. And guess what? This elephant is growing so big that it will not be able to get out of the door if you don't do something about it. This is where we are at the moment. And we have to hope that this kind of research, these brave researchers who are willing to take a risk, stepping outside of the comfort zone to try and bring true science to the table, will hopefully force regulators, industry, to do the research that should have been done before. Because this risk is not just the high risk for COVID-19. They have sadly extended it to the whole population, including children and babies. They really need to get those answers quickly. Have a great evening.